Well, thank you for that um, introduction. And thank you for inviting me to Catalonia at such an important time in its history. I will talk about the Frascati Manual because that's what I am supposed to talk about. And I will try to keep it uh, to the time that I have uh, been allotted. The first thing I am going to do is try to find the electronic mouse or device so that I can move from, I think it's right there. <laughs> Otherwise, we're going to be staring at this same page for the rest of the, ah, fine, thank you. I, uh, the preparation is extremely good. It's my eyesight that is failing. So uh, we are here to talk about the Frascati Manual and specifically about the seventh edition. The presentation I'm going to give is far too detailed for um, the relatively short time I have to be with you. But you do have the PDF version, which I think you're all getting as part of the output of this meeting. So I encourage you to read what really in interests you. All my presentations uh, that I give before I go off to Maastricht or Africa or wherever are first given to my cat. And I can tell you that my cat has yet to survive to the end of this particular presentation. Now, she's a highly critical and these days quite knowledgeable animal. Um, but she doesn't write anything, which is probably just as well. What I am going to do is start with a background to the Frascati Manual um, and look at how the sixth revision differs from the previous one. And this, as has already been pointed out, is a major revision to Frascati. And this is because a lot of things have been going on in the world uh, over the last decade or so. Globalization is becoming a very serious issue, and we have seen changes in international standards in other uh, domains. In the economic domain, the system of national accounts uh, produced a new manual in 2008, and we will get to statistical manuals and where Frascati fits as we move along, but they do work together, and that's extremely important. So I will look at the history, I will look at the main features, then I will take you chapter by chapter, if any of you are still awake, through the rest of the manual and get to how OECD is trying to implement it. Uh, by way of history, I uh, was the joint editor of this manual, so I've had the pleasure of reading every word of it, um, and I agree with most of them. The previous edition, I was actually the chair of the committee that uh, uh, presents the uh, manual. Uh, my previous, uh, my colleague, the previous chair, had done all the work. I simply picked it up in the last year, which was very good. The manual before that, I was a delegate and the manual before that, I was a user, so I have been involved in Frascati for a while. So what is the Frascati manual? It is uh, an OECD standard, and as has already been mentioned, it is a non-binding standard. You are not required by international law to keep to Frascati. There are no Frascati police following you around, making sure that you do it correctly. That is a good thing. This manual in particular has become a global manual, and that was deliberate. And the way you discover that is that you look at the previous manual and you find an annex interpreting the manual for use in developing countries. That annex has gone. And the whole manual is now accessible for use in developing countries. So that means it's gone beyond being an OECD and European Union manual. It is now global. 
Now that is an important step. We can go back to 1963 when Chris Freeman, aided by Alison Young, wrote the first edition of this manual and it was approved in Frascati, uh, a place near to Rome where they produce excellent wine. <laughs> I don't think that's why they met there, uh, but it is well remembered in the history of the manual. So it, uh, it was the beginning and we have been working on it ever since. A characteristic of manual revision in the OECD is that nothing changes unless there is an empirical basis for that change. So if the minister wakes up one morning and thinks we should view research and development totally differently, the response is, well, minister, where is the evidence? And that ends that conversation. Well, you hope it ends that conversation. So there is the Frascati manual. So why revise uh, in 2015? I've just given you a number of um, reasons. The fact that the world is becoming much more interconnected, whether we like it or not, we have to deal with it when we are building standards to measure research and development, to interpret the data, and to draw inferences from that interpretation. The system of national accounts has changed, and that is particularly important. One of the changes in 2008 is that R&D expenditure has been capitalized. And what that means is that expenditure on research and development is now a capital expenditure, an intangible capital expenditure, like machinery and equipment which is a tangible capital expenditure. And this means that if you are in this business, get to know your friends in the system of national accounts, because if they haven't already done it, they are going to become very interested in expenditure on R&D. You will find that conversation a little difficult because national accountants are difficult. But that's something we learn to live with. Other classifications have changed. ISIC, the International Standard Industrial Classification, Revision 4, not any of the earlier ones, is a major change in the industrial classification. And it is aligning more and more with NACE, used in the European Union, uh, the second revision, and with NAICS, which is the uh, classification system used in the United States, Mexico, and Canada. So all these cl classification systems are coming together, and because of the information economy, are looking at industry quite differently. So make sure you are thinking about ISIC Rev 4. And then we have ISCO and ISCAD, occupations and education, and they have changed too. So a lot of change is going on in how we guide measurement, and R&D is becoming a global thing, particularly relevant uh, in any developed country, but more so uh, when you see how the Gates Foundation works in developing countries. So we have a lot to worry about. So we do it. We revise the manual, uh, and people become interested. And what is particularly interesting from my perspective, having been told in a seminar I gave some years ago that it would never happen, uh, that we see that the U.S. economy is about to go up by 3%, not because anybody is working harder, I can tell you, but because the national accountants have decided to capitalize research and development. So we've just achieved a great thing in the United States and similarly in other countries that have capitalized R&D. So this manual isn't an academic project. This has real impact in the world in which we live. So we look at the revision process and we look at what we are trying to do. And I should probably put my glasses on if I'm going to see what is in front of me. Uh, and relevance matters. Uh, 
and I'll come back to relevance when I get to data quality. Feasibility in this business is extremely important because if you can't do it, it's not relevant. And again, it is based on consensus in the organization that produces this manual. And there is the manual. That's why I wanted the PowerPoint version rather than the PDF version. It's more entertaining if you are still with me. So going on then to boundaries applying to the revision, it is a statistical manual, and you can see it as an extension of the SNA 2008, dealing with a particular topic, which is research and development. And you can download SNA 2008. Don't print it. It's this thick. But you can download it, and you can read it selectively. It is a NESTI responsibility. NESTI is the working party of national experts on science and technology indicators at the OECD. NESTI has been in existence, more or less, since before the OECD existed. And it will be in existence after the OECD ceases to exist because it actually deals with real problems that you and I have to cope with. So it is an important working party. Uh, it also draws on input from other parties, and I will emphasize the fact that it is a statistical manual uh, because in order to get out of the OECD, which is very difficult, I can tell you, uh, it has to be reviewed by the Committee on uh, Statistics and Statistical Policy. That is a group of very serious statisticians <laughs> who don't let anything out uh, without serious consideration. It is also approved by the Parent Committee, which is the Committee on Scientific and Technological Policy. That's a subject matter committee, and they worry about policy, and that is another issue. This isn't just for statisticians. It is for people who develop policy and then oversee the monitoring and the evaluation of policy once it is implemented. Notice the word implemented. Ministers like to announce policies because they get sound bites on the 6 o'clock news. This is good. But the next step is actually getting the legislation through the parliament and then implementing the policy. This is difficult. And then you want to be able to produce numbers to show that the policy works or does not work, in which case the minister is less happy than previously <laughs> and your career becomes limited. But that's, an, again, another issue. Let me move on, and I'm going to go over these two slides very quickly because all they show you is that the process of revision involved a lot of countries doing a lot of things, and not all were OECD member countries. See Russia there doing R&D personnel, and Russia is a very active uh, observer member of NESTE. So everybody got into the act, which was good, and we used a lot of technology. We held a lot of workshops, and I'm delighted to say that using the technology was a very good thing because it meant that people didn't have to travel um, uh, thousands of kilometers in order to sit in one room staring at one another. They were able to do it uh, from their office and that saved both money and carbon footprint. So big task, many years, many people, much work. I think is the message I wish to leave with you. And now let's move on to the contents of the, 15, of the 2015 ed edition, uh, which you can't read, so I'm going to go into more detail uh, about this. Notice the very first thing, if you happen to have memorized the uh, title of the previous manual, proposed has disappeared. So we no longer have proposed guidelines for collecting and reporting data on research and experimental development. We have guidelines, uh, which may be more of an influence of our friends in uh, 
Luxembourg, Eurostat, than of the OECD, but it's another issue. So we have guidelines and recommendations. We have undertaken considerable change. But a point I'm going to make to you now is that most of the changes have to do with clarification of what was in the previous edition. (coughs) Clarification, taking account of the fact that things have changed in the world in which we live. But the fundamental definitions have not changed substantially. I'll take you through the definitions and I will show you where they have changed a little. So we're going to start with chapter one, and you can't read that and neither can I. Uh, So I am going to make two or three points. One I've already made that we are working much more closely with the system of national accounts. And we're doing this because of the language in the system of national accounts, which we are trying to use to be part of that statistical domain, and also because of the fact that R&D has been capitalized in the SNA. We're going to look at sector-specific chapters so that we can see, each of us, the part of R&D measurement that we really like to think about, and I will have to be very careful given the amount of time Uh, I am dealing with, and we should, as statisticians, some of us are statisticians, some of us are policy people, and policy people have a tendency to say that they would like to know a long list of things about what goes on in an R&D establishment. The statisticians are there to discourage them from presenting long lists because when you go with the questionnaire to the business or the government department or to the university, they look at you in amazement and say, I don't have time to fill in something of this magnitude. Go away. Well, people don't always say that. Sometimes they're more polite in how they formulate that statement. So there's a delicate balance here of policy need and statistical feasibility. Remember that word crept into the slides a moment ago. So we're going to look at concepts and definitions. And you have there the 2002 definition and the 2015 definition. And you will notice that there is not a lot of change But if we look into the third line of the 2002 definition, and this is where it all fell apart, somebody noticed that it referred to including knowledge of man, culture, and society. There were distinguished delegates to Nesti who made the point that perhaps men are obsolete and should be removed from the definition some hapless person suggested, how about men and women? And I don't know where the voice came from, but it was that this was too restrictive. I'm still trying to work that one out. But we ended up with uh, humankind. And not everybody liked it, but not, no one voted against it. Remember, OECD is a consensus organization. So when you get 30 seconds of silence, having put the summary to the group, so long as you've got 30 seconds of silence, you move on. Most of the meeting may absolutely dislike the idea, but they're going to get you on something else, so it's fine. So consensus, you are not blocking it. When we look at the changes, really what we see, as I said, you would see, is a change of language, Uh, but the basic substance remains the same. You will notice arts creeping into uh, humanities, so arts and humanities, and there was a strong group pushing for the inclusion of research in the arts. 
And this reflects the fact that in our electronic society, multiply connected with social networks, we have different views on art, electronic uh, information, knowledge, how that knowledge flows, how people are changed, and where the arts do have an impact even on research and development. So it's there. That was probably the most significant change. So if I move on now, the type of R&D is unchanged. Uh, Applied research on the whole is unchanged. Also crept in some years ago. It was, was an error, but it went through several editions, as these things do. We finally caught it and got rid of it. Um, and we have slight modification to experimental development. So the definitions have more or less remained the same. If you have memorized the two previous definitions, it's not a major struggle to make the transition to the next lot. When we go into concepts and definitions, uh, our, we have colleagues out there who thought we'd really done something different when we specified five characteristics of research and development, and there they are, requirements for research and development. Uh, but they're all in the previous edition. What happened in this edition is that they all got brought together and put in one place. And those who haven't read thoroughly the previous edition were a little shocked. But nothing is going on here. R&D project has crept in because a lot of businesses and government departments do set up projects in order to do R&D, in order to solve a particular problem. And they keep records for their projects. It makes it easier, therefore, to extract the data. Uh, we can look at boundaries, which is quite important. What is R&D and what is not? The five characteristics give you some help. There are other manuals out there that uh, UNESCO is working on that deal with other science activities, but not R&D. And some of those will be appearing uh, over the next year. Uh, so we will see boundaries having more documentation, and that is important. Institutional sectors and classifications. Uh, this, if you read it, will be more or less what you are used to. The business enterprise sector, higher education, private nonprofit, government. So nothing new except the rest of the world is turned in, is taken over from abroad because rest of world is what you find in the SNA. The mapping of SNA classifications on to Frascati classifications took some time, and there are, if you look very carefully, some gray areas, but I'm not going to tell you where they are. Uh, so we've managed to deal with most of it, and higher education verges on being a nightmare uh, because universities can appear in all sectors except probably, and I, I could be contradicted on this, the household sector. So you can have private universities, you can have uh, public universities, uh, you can have private nonprofit universities, uh, but in Frascati you have got um, a higher education sector, and we go through uh, a, an elaborate decision process in order to find out where higher education is. Uh, I considered turning this into a board game at one point, but got very little support. Uh, but that uh, particular decision tree is worth glancing at. It summarizes a great deal of knowledge which is in the manual. So we're now going to look briefly at allocation of resources uh, and look at some differences. Allocation of resources, funds. Allocation of resources, humans. Uh, and those of you who have been in the measurement business 
will know that dealing with expenditure is difficult. Dealing with humans is more difficult. Um, and just try explaining full-time equivalents and headcounts to a group that's never worked in this domain before, and it is not easy. So um, we do have um, the fact that we have capitalized R&D coming back to us, the role of globalization in the measurement of expenditure. Therefore, money is crossing boundaries, coming into the country from all sorts of places, going out of the country in all sorts of ways that are difficult to track, and doing the technological balance of payments is not easy. I think that's the summary of expenditure. When we go into uh, uh, the uh, additional problems with this, uh, we end up clarifying how to report on general university funds. You may think that's easy. General university funds are not easy anywhere. And I can think of one country where they regard general university funds as being part of the university sector because all universities are independent, and that's their money. Other countries put general university funds in the government sector because that's where the money comes from. And people argue about it. OECD puts it in the government sector. The country I'm thinking of doesn't, so it never quite agrees with the OECD. Human resources, and I'm going to have to speed up if I'm going to make my time, um, but I will get as close to that as I can. Human resources, as I said, continue to be difficult, but what you've got in front of you is going to be roughly the same as in the previous manual, with an exception, which is upsetting my colleagues in Africa. And that exception is one can admit that some master's students are doing research. And this really upsets them because what that means is that every country in Africa is going to report every master's student as uh, engaged in R&D. No, you actually have to demonstrate that the master's students doing probably an MPhil rather than an MA are doing R&D, and that reduces the number down. But, of course, all countries want the highest possible number uh, on expenditure and humans engaged. That's perfectly natural. You don't walk in to the minister's office with a small number or you end up working for somebody else. Perhaps doesn't happen in Catalonia. Let me move on to, well, let me move out of measurement of R&D personnel and spend a little bit of time on survey methodology. And this is, you would think it's simple because statisticians have been measuring things for a very long time. When you come to R&D, and innovation for that matter, it is not simple. It is not simple for R&D because it is one of the most concentrated variables in economic statistics. And what that means is, if you look at R&D, there are a few countries that dominate R&D expenditure. Within a country, there are a few industries which dominate R&D expenditure. And within industries, there are a few businesses, usually, sometimes universities, that dominate R&D expenditure. So this means that if you get the top 50 performers, you can have between 60% to 80% of R&D performed in the country. And that means going in and taking a statistical sample uh, and doing something that you would do for employment statistics is not going to work. You must have the top performers of R&D in your highly concentrated sample. And that is why you never should even think of combining an R&D survey with an innovation survey because the distributions are totally different. Forgive me, I get quite agitated about this sort of thing. Uh, we also have to deal with uh, confidentiality if you're surveying business or universities. 
uh, you have to assure them that whatever they give you isn't going to be given to the tax authority or sold to some other organization. It takes a lot of convincing, so this is quite important. Uh, we have dangerous indicators. GERD is a dangerous indicator. Why? Because you give it to our political masters and they say, ah, divide it by GDP and require the entire European Union to arrive at 3% as soon as possible, 2% coming from the business sector. That is potentially dangerous because you get a lot of people moving funds into an area uh, to produce better R&D statistics uh, which could perhaps be better allocated to supporting the performance of innovation, which is about putting product on the market and making money, which you can tax an opinion. Uh, mercifully, I'm not speaking on behalf of the OECD, so I can't be shut down at this point. Data quality is a big issue. Relevance, accuracy, timeliness, accessibility, interoperability, interoper and coherence to list six characteristics of quality. And timeliness is a key issue. If the minister is going to appear in question time at two o'clock and you walk into the minister's office with the definitive answer to the question at four o'clock, then you had better find another job. Timeliness matters. Uh, let's go to the business enterprise sector because it is always fun. And what I'm about to do now in the remaining minus four minutes is um, go through very quickly the sectors. And once I've got through the sectors, uh, I can actually bring this talk, I think, to an end uh, because the rest you've got uh, in your handout and you can read it yourselves. One of the uh, exercises I do when I'm teaching, I actually teach innovation, I don't teach uh, research and development, although it does creep in, uh, is I asked my students to take MSTI, the Main Science and Technology Indicators publication of the OECD, and I asked them to look at the BIRD, Business Enterprise R&D, divided by the GERD, gross domestic, never forget that word, expenditure on R&D, and look at that ratio for all the countries in the MSTI. Then look at all those countries with a ratio of less than 0.5 and write me a one paragraph story on what you found. I leave that as an exercise for the group. It is rather fun and you might find that Spain would perform differently from Catalonia, which I think was the bottom line of the previous talk that you have received. So business enterprise is more or less uh, as it was. Um, the definitions remain essentially the same, and you can see towards the bottom the case of combined R&D and innovation surveys has been accepted but not recommended. And it shouldn't be recommended. Let me take you to government. Now, when I'm talking about government, I am talking about performance. R&D is a performance measurement. If somebody tries to tell you that you can measure it through budget, they are wrong. The only way you can measure R&D is by performance. Now, this gives rise to interesting political discussions. This government has spent X billion currency units of your choice on aerospace. When we go out and measure R&D performed on aerospace, we get a much smaller number. What is going on? Well, the answer to that particular question, and I won't name the country, is it a very big thing that absorbed the money? Was it going into the production stage and it wasn't R&D anymore? Not according to the Frascati manual. But they took the money, thank you very much, built the very big thing, and it went off into space, where I believe it still is. But that debate goes on in other industries as well. So performance uh, and the measurement of government performance is difficult because people in government departments, as in universities, are very bright and able people, 
and extremely adept at not answering questions. So it's very hard to get to the bottom of the questions. Um, another story, but I, I don't have the time. The stories are probably more entertaining than the um, <laughs> text, but we have to limit ourselves. Higher education R&D uh, is quite important, and there are different ways of doing it, and again, covered here, and they have not changed a lot. Some countries actually survey the higher education sector, and the United States is an example. And they can get away with it because they threaten people with having their NSF grants cut off if they don't fill in the questionnaire. I'm not quite that strong, but the hint is there. Uh, other countries, Germany, for example, uh, use coefficients. Uh, they do a time use survey. They look at the amount of time that uh, professorial staff spends on teaching and on R&D. They work out what uh, they should expect as the R&D expenditure, and they also uh, are able to track grants and contracts coming into the university so they can take those out, look at GAF, allocate GAF. So uh, a certain amount of uh, serious estimation goes on and you arrive at a figure about which people argue, but it's not easy. Uh, private nonprofit, relatively small, uh, and I am trying to get to the end of this, Madam Chair, uh, and again, not significantly changed, uh, except the sector in the system of national accounts is non-profit institutions serving households. Those non-profit institutions only constitute that sector. NPISH, it is referred to. And the reason for that is you can have non-product, non-profit institutes in the private sector and in the government sector. They are all over the place in different firm, you know, forms. And this is a serious classification issue. Rest of world, uh, and this is something I suggest you look at a bit more carefully when you have some time because of the uh, importance of what's crossing our national boundaries in the domain of research and development. So I'm now stopping with the sectors. I will go through two government points, and then I'm going to stop. Government budget appropriation or outlays. GBARD, as it used to be called, has turned into GBARD, Government Budget Allocations for Research and Development. Appropriations and outlays are terms that come from the U.S. and goes back in history to when the United States had a significant involvement in the Frascati revision. And these little phrases live on in dark corners of the manual. Uh, and in this major revision, we have found most of them. Not all, but most of them. So this is where you look at government support for R&D rather than government performance for R&D, and that gets us to the four classical questions aimed at the minister. What did this country spend on R&D? Well, you've done the measurement. You know what the answer is. The minister can give it immediately. Where was it spent, minister? Well, you can give two answers to that. You can do it geographically. So much was spent in Catalonia. So much was spent in the rest of Spain, if we can make that link, mm -hmm. Catalonia being in Spain. I'm quite worried about all of this, but you understand it. Uh, so geographically, and in which industries did you spend the money? So are you pumping all of our tax money into aerospace, for reasons we're not going to go into, uh, you, the minister can answer that question. Why did you do it? Well, in surveys of governments, you may or may not have socioeconomic objectives. So if you've tabulated those, you can answer that question. We did it to save the environment, to save lives, make people happy, whatever is the uh, wish of the day. The final question, minister, what did this country get for spending that money? And that is the serious question. And that is what you are all here, whether you're in the policy business or the measurement business, to answer. That's a very serious challenge. 
Tax relief, I am going to show you the slide, but I'm not going to talk about it. Some people think tax relief for businesses is a good thing. It encourages them to do more R&D. Let me go back to innovation and tell you that no matter what country you're in, more firms innovate than do research and development. So if you're doing a tax policy encouraging businesses to do research and development, who's helping all those other firms that aren't doing research and development? What policies do you have for them? Now, I have a whole list of answers to that, but that is a serious issue. Annexes we mentioned, and they are uh, coming or going. Those are going. Implementation is within the OECD. Uh, rather than in your surveys. There is a URL which you will find useful to follow up on this discussion. Um, The data collections, this is too technical for this, and we have come to the end, and I apologize for going over time. Thank you.